Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, About that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. I was in 10th grade. I was about to receive my Eagle Scout Award. Some of you know this story. It's one that I do repeat. Part of being an Eagle Scout is you say that you are reverent, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, thrifty. All these things, reverent, meaning go to church, believe in God, be a part of the service of the organization. There was a time in the United States military that if you had received your Eagle Scout, you were actually bumped up a tad bit in your pay grade because they saw in what Scouts could be perceived as a paramilitary organization. They saw discipline, they saw leadership, they saw people trained in seventh and eighth and ninth grade to do that, to plan and to execute a plan. I think that public schools should include a class called Think. I really do. Some call it symbolic logic. Symbolic logic is an imperative, I think. I don't think you should be able to graduate from college or get a master's degree, never a doctorate, if you haven't had classwork in symbolic logic. I think it's an imperative. The biblical example of how this works is in our liturgical calendar. Today is, by the way, Happy New Year. Church, always doing things different. And for the first time, something actually ahead of the world. We're a month ahead of everybody else's New Year in the United States. Well, those who celebrate New Year's in the United States and around the globe. The first Sunday in Advent. Preparation for and the arrival of a person, place, or thing of significance. Advent. New Year, beginnings. But what a crazy way to begin. The text that I just read, if you heard it, and maybe we need to read it, the problem with reading in church, I think, is that we read things once. If you read it a second time and a third time and a fourth time, It's amazing what finally sticks and what jumps out. About that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels nor the heavens nor the Son. Jesus doesn't even know. Only the Father, God the Father. Not God the Son, not God the Holy Spirit. But then we talk about Noah in this lesson. And what's the Noah story? Oh, isn't that a beautiful story? Are you kidding me? Wiping out humanity? Saving a remnant? That's the Bible. Let's just wipe them out. We'll drown them all. Okay. Two will be in the field. One will be taken. One will be left. Two will be grinding meal together. One will be taken. One will be left. Wow. Let's teach that one to our little children. Tonight, if the rapture comes, mommy or daddy or aunt or uncle, one will be here. One won't be here. What? Are we crazy? Seriously. Am I that practical? Do I need to go figure out uh, maybe I should be a CPA? Then at least it's It adds up, right? Keep awake, therefore, for you don't know what day the Lord's coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known, and here we go again. These are apocalyptic. 
end of times. All those movies that are on television and on the screen that I never go to because they drive me up a wall. Anybody ever think that they could have planned this better? How about an upbeat Bible verse? How about a passage? Well, just for goodness sake, can't you just take 1 Corinthians and throw it in the gospel lesson? And let's just talk about love. Even that would be better than this crazy stuff. I mean, seriously, is it helpful? Do you find this helpful? Or have you been lulled into the comfort of daydreaming in church that, you know what, it's just another one of these passages that, for goodness sake, Bob, just make it playful. Make it fun. Our mission statement, our purpose statement says that we want to be joy-filled followers of Jesus Christ. Well, where's the joy in this? Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you where the joy is. So here we go. In this passage, <clears throat> an unknown future, the second coming of Christ, but definitely, according to this passage in Matthew, the tax collector, that's why I said CPA. Get it, Matthew? Okay, all right. I thought it was funny. But anyway, definitely judgment. There's definitely judgment in this. So today, pastors are going to be motivated really, really hard to explain this passage and to somehow soften it a bit. But I think we run a risk when we take God and we somehow, oh, what would the word be? Um, we, we water down God. We, we make God like Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or, <clears throat> or someone that's just Jesus, my best friend. Jesus, my, my best buddy. When we do that, I think... There's a, it comes at a cost because I think we miss the whole of the New Testament. This is a pretty bold statement. I think we miss the whole big picture of the New Testament when we water God down like that. And as unnerving and discomforting and frightening as this text might be, this coming of Christ, this second coming, this end time where judgment seems to be all over the place, it's inescapable in the Bible. It's what the Bible says. So if you want to throw the Bible out and think of God, you're welcome to do that, and many people do. But you see in this judgment, because it is about judgment, what's the flip side of judgment? Justice. So you have judgment here, and you have justice over here. And in the Old and New Testament, the dominant theme is how we treat one another. And especially how we treat those who are vulnerable and in need. The dominant theme in both the Old and New Testament, overwhelmingly from front to back, Genesis to Revelation, all 66 books and letters, whether it's in poetry <clears throat> or in the Pentateuch, the first five books where you see Jewish Midrash, Stories that are embellished to even heighten the level of meaning and, and interpretation. How we treat one another and how we treat those who are vulnerable is the absolute central theme. So if we give up on the judgment, then we erase or we ignore the meaningful sense of God's justice. Judgment. So let me try and put it in um, language that I know that we all, oh, oh, this is, this is going to come at a risk to me. I'll get some letters on this, I'm sure. Do you ever notice how conservatives, not a helpful world, word in this day, but if you look at conservatives and how they tend to really emphasize judgment, it's black and white. And the social justice part, well, let's not deal with the social justice. Let them take care of themselves and pull themselves up by their bootstraps and get a job. Can't they just go get a job? There are bazillions of jobs now, right? So conservatives, strong on judgment, but really weak <clears throat> on caring for others, social justice. And yet it's clear 
that social justice is Jesus' mission because one chapter next in line, if you just go to chapter 25, the passage says that he will judge the nations by one standard. That the nations will be judged by one standard. How people were treated, those in need. So if you fall into that vulnerability of going more toward judgment and less toward the central theme of scripture, in particular now one chapter away, where we will be judged, the nations will be judged, and how we treat people, in particular those in need. Well, then it's something for us to have a discussion. And there are billions of people around the world that probably are like that. But then let's go the other side, you know, liberals. They just want to talk about social justice and let's help everybody. No matter what. They seem to not count the cost of that reconciling God of love and mercy. That's the hocus pocus loves that I don't really care for. <clears throat> but didn't the passage just say that God will come as a thief in the night? That seems like pretty harsh judgment to me and that seems like something that we ought to pay, pay attention to and doesn't it say that God will judge the quick and the dead so it's not conservative it's not liberal and if you've listened to the last four weeks you've heard me say <clears throat> in the midst of all the divisiveness in our world in our culture, in our country in our town stop it We've got to find a way to draw them both together. It is both and. Judgment and justice, they do go together. Now let me prove it. Let me prove it. Jesus showed his, in his life how to live and love each other. And in his death, he showed us how much God loves us. In Jesus' earthly life, he shows us how to truly live and love one another. But in his death, he shows the Father's immense love for us. God expects us to treat each other in the same way that Jesus treated us with a sacrificial love. To think more highly of others than we think of ourselves. Now, lest you think that I have this figured out, I don't. I know how to read, and I know how to put this message together, and I believe it's the truth of the Word of God. But where is the comfort in it? The comfort is in blending the two and being both and. Let God be the judge. Let us be the hands of justice. Let God be the one who brings judgment to the nations, based on, predicated on, the way we treat one another. So let's just treat one another better. I work in the church, I'm a pastor, and I'm on the roster of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. And when I'm around clergy, sometimes I see the struggle in this. And it's hard. It is hard to be a part of the club, like the card-carrying, plastic-collar, white-collar, black-shirt guy, and to see the leaders of the church be critical and judgmental of each other and of the world. I know we're tired. That's not an excuse. I know we've been through a global pandemic. That's not an excuse. <clears throat> Sore throat is. <laughs> excuse me. I think maybe the best I can do is offer you some questions and I'm going to slowly go through this because I think that we can benefit by just pausing a second. Did, did I give you enough on what God says about judgment? I will come to judge the quick and the dead. That's biblical. Did I give you enough so that you know that we will be judged on how we treat one another? So how then shall we live? It's easy to say, just be nicer. Be more compassionate. What was the thing that went on like 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Pa uh, you pass on a good deed. What, what was that called? 
pass it forward. There's some. There's another one. Pay it for. Pay it forward. Yeah, yeah. That was just. I, I think it had an impact in the world. <clears throat> I think 9/11 had an impact on the world. I think every time there's a snowstorm, you know what I think about snowstorms when you can't get out of your driveway? I'm gonna get to see my neighbors. <laughs> really? Yeah. And that's saying something in a 55 and over place. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. <laughs> um, let me see if this helps. I think we have to be concerned about our own wakefulness. In this time of the year, I don't know if people are spending more time preparing for Christmas or preparing for Christ. And I know that it can get really, really, we can get caught up, the staff, we can get caught up in making sure that everything's ready to go so that the chancel area is clear so we can have the different events here. We can get caught up in who's going to be at the door. We can get caught up in bulletins and what colors are we going to have and how much are the tickets and what do we do about this and that. And it doesn't take long to lose Jesus in the midst of even something like the Messiah. That's kind of ironic, isn't it? Or is it moronic? Either way, it's wrong. So if the season, if this is a time that you get caught up in the Christmas balls and the lights, I love that. You saw me two, three weeks ago when I was going to go hang up the Christmas tree lights with Ava and Lily. Ah, oh, that was the best part of the day. That was the best part of the day because it's loving your neighbor, literally, and having fun. Olivia, the reason I came down and sat with you, some might be wondering, right? So it's really simple. I said to her, when I was in 10th grade, I used to go to church by myself. My mother and father, one of them would drive me up to the church, but I'd go in and sit by myself. And I remember being there and what it felt like to be alone. I like sometimes sitting alone in different things. But in church, if we're a welcoming organization, if we have a strategy for hospitality, did anybody say, Olivia, can I hang out with you? Probably not. But I'm really glad you're here, kid, because to see a high school kid walk in this church by herself and sit in the pew when I've got hundreds of card-carrying members of St. John's, well done, child. Very, very well done. I hope that your coming here will lift you up, will stir your brain. You've got a marvelous mind. And I hope that when you leave here, you'll take whatever you learn from this silly pastor and you'll take it out into the world. And it might start with just be awake, be alert, watch everything around you. Because there are so many distractions. Pick out the ones that matter, focus on them where you can provide care, and the others, let them go to somebody else. So we have to tend to our own wakefulness. Consider the future that you want to live in. I've made a decision as I begin this church year, I am crystal clear on who I am and my purpose, crystal clear. I may be a member of the church small c, I may be on the roster of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. I will give up both to be a part of the church with a capital C. I will choose this year to love more deeply and more fully because if that's what this text is on this first Sunday in Advent, then I want to do it. I want to surround myself with people that are committed to loving more deeply. Maybe the older I get, the less the judgment makes sense to me. Maybe the older I get, the more that does make sense is the depth of a God who would give his only son to sacrifice his son for us. There's really no room for judgment. There's really no room for varsity Christians and junior varsity Christians. There's no room for that. For God so loved the world, it doesn't say in the Bible, God so loved those who took an oath or swore the creed or wrote a page in the Bible. God says that God loved the world. Through human authors, I believe no matter what mistakes they made as disciples or as apostles, the knuckleheads ultimately got it right. So I want you to consider, I want us to consider as a congregation, what future do you want to live in? 
I know that this year, even though we have a handful of students in this congregation, I want to spend time with them. And yes, I will get to every homebound person and I will provide communion for them. But when I go, <clears throat> I'm not going to just say hi. I want to know their faith. Because if they're homebound and they're homebound and of age and they might be one that I might get a phone call saying, Pastor Bob, we need your services because our loved one has just died, then I want to be able to say something about them of significance. I want to say I sat with them and I know where their heart is. I knew they were doubting Jesus or I knew that they were sold out and totally turned on to Jesus, but I don't want to bluff my way through a funeral service. There is nothing like it. Ask Becky, ask Shannon how many times I walk out of a family meeting and I say to them, I've got nothing. I have nothing to say. And then God does what God does through me and I think performs miracles in spite of me. And that's the really cool part. Consider the future that you want to live in. Seek it and do it. You get one life on this planet. Might as well live it to your fullest. Name your own dissatisfactions. Pretty sure you know that I can look at things objectively and say, that's wrong, that needs to change, something needs to happen. And I'm pretty sure you know that I am driven in a way that I don't think is always healthy, but I want to make a change. I sound like Michael Jackson, don't I? Oh, that'd be beautiful. Any way to get Michael Jackson here? In spirit? Yeah. How many people criticized, ridiculed, mocked, and jeered? And yet, that's the song that comes to my mind? How many people criticized, mocked, and jeered Jesus? Name your own dissatisfactions. Rediscover where you've anchored your hope. If your hope is in your family, good for you. But I sure hope it's deeper than your family. If your priority is your family, well, we, we focus on family time, quality time. Is it? How much conversation takes place? Are devices put away? Your own included. Rediscover where you've anchored your hope. My hope is in Jesus Christ. And that at 63, God will make me better than I am now. For God's sake, not for mine. Wesley said, I love the line. I asked God to set me on fire. I know what that's like as a pastor. And Wesley said, people come to watch him burn. That's not a bad way to live. To be set ablaze with the spirit. Recommit yourself to accompanying, following, and leading others on the journey. We've committed to being a learning community. Some have. And that's why we've had dozens of people attend small groups. And there is difference of opinion, but nobody is quiet. And even the ones that are least comfortable in a setting where they might be asked to say something, I don't think as a pastor I could be more proud of her when she attends a small group and she participates because she has a good mind and a good heart. But I'm not telling you that I'm talking about Nancy. Recommit yourself to accompanying, following, and leading others on the journey. Our little ones know how to lead because they've had a magnificent teacher in Kathy Krauss. Our older ones you have had each other through the years, and you are remolding who we are as a ministry. Be present with and for your siblings in Christ. It is easier to keep awake and stay engaged when we have trusted company around us. Is there anything that you want to do in community, in a group, 
that you have not yet had a chance to do. We can do just about anything here at St. John's if in this new year we commit to I'm going to get a Y membership and I'm going to get in shape. And by February, I'm done. That's what it is, right? It's six, seven weeks. People like go to the gym. You, you want to get a gym membership in January. Just don't show up until February because it'll be too crowded. And then after the middle of February, yeah, you're all good. I have a Y membership. I occasionally use it to take a shower there. I haven't used a piece of equipment or the pool in years ridiculous. It's easier to keep awake and stay engaged when we have trusted company around us. Will you be that kind of a congregation? Will you change the world? I believe that God believes you can, and I believe what God believes, that you can, even more than you are now, Oh, I really, really wish I would have done this right. I would have had the YouTube clip up of Michael Jaff Jackson, and I would have just played it. It's just amazing. The words? Well, that's not the Bible. You really don't think that God inspired that music? What's the name of it? I'm going to make a change? Make a change? Tell me that is not an awesome song. Do you know it, Alina? Do you know this song? Man, what? Man in the Mirror. Man in the Mirror. That's it, Man in the Mirror. You think we, can, we could change the words to people in the mirror? Because it's, you know, there's some women that could change too, right? Anyway. <laughs> don't, don't, don't push it. <laughs> yeah, don't push it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness sakes. It's really hard to go from man in the mirror to hark a thrilling voice is sounding. But let's do it anyway. <laughs>